So the question is, can you achieve a better, more crisp and punchy metal guitar tone simply through editing? And if so, how exactly do you do this within Reaper? And also, how do you dial in a professional sounding metal vocal mix? Welcome to Viewer Questions Answered, episode, can I do this? Nine. Okay, so without any further ado, let's jump into this excellent group of questions sent in by email subscribers. And our first question comes from Kyle. Hey Bobby, your channel has been my lifeline for a couple of years now. I'm really starting to get it. But one thing I'm still not grasping is editing. I make all my own music and usually track guitars while listening to the SD3 drum track I already mapped out. The guitars will sometimes push the beat and sometimes sit nice in the pocket within measures of each other. How can I go about editing in Reaper if I'm pushing and also in the pocket with the same take? And how would I accomplish proper crossfading within Reaper? Thanks. Okay, well Kyle, I love this question because editing is something that most people don't think to do or are simply just too lazy to do. And I have news for you. Every single pro producer on the planet, regardless of genre, but especially within heavy music, are master editors. Now I know that might sound intimidating, but it really isn't. It really just comes down to taking the time to edit your takes. And like you mentioned, when takes push and pull the beat, that can greatly affect the overall uh, guitar tracks, which believe it or not, will affect the perceived tone of your guitar tracks. And there are two main culprits when it comes to guitar performances that will really affect the tone and just the sound of your production in general. One is when your guitars push to beat and play ahead of the drums, that never sounds right. And also when your two guitar tracks are conflicting where maybe one is pulling the beat and one is pushing the beat. That will never ever in a million years sound right. Now the main pushback that I get whenever I tell people about this when they're starting out is they say, well, I want a more natural production. I don't want my you know track sounding unnatural. And the truth is they've been editing in the studio way before DAWs. It just took much more time and they had to be handy with razor blades working on a tape machine. So with that being said, you're gonna wanna make sure that both of your guitar parts are at least in the pocket, even if they're not 100% in sync with one another, you're gonna wanna make sure that again, they're both in the pocket and not pushing against the drums. Most of the time when people struggle with their guitar tone, it's not that there's anything wrong with their tone, it's just that their takes aren't in the pocket and just don't sound right and gunk up their entire production. Back in the day, I spent so much time thinking that my mixes sucked and that I was doing something wrong only to realize I just wasn't paying close enough attention to the performances when working with bands. Now, I just wanna say this, if you're a Reaper user, you are in luck because editing within Reaper is phenomenal, especially when it comes to slip editing. Now, I'll be doing videos on this in the future, but I'll just tell you this in a nutshell. The two things that are going to save you when it comes to editing in Reaper is slip editing. Now, if you're unfamiliar with how to perform slip editing within Reaper, just do a quick Google search and you can easily find it. But again, I will cover it in future videos. And the other thing when it comes to crossfades is that you can enable automatic crossfades within Reaper. So you pretty much don't have to even think about crossfades. You could simply make cuts. The fades are automatically applied and you can slip the audio around so it's in time. And again, you don't have to go bananas making your guitar sound like the Terminator played them. All you have to do is just make sure that all of your guitar tracks are pocketed. It is well worth it. And again, all pro producers do this. So Kyle, thank you for your question. And again, I will be covering this in future tutorials, uh, but hopefully that'll get you set in the right direction right away. Okay, and our next question comes from Ben. My number one question right now is how to best set up a DAW for recording. For example, I have a Pro Tools subscription, but every time I try to use third-party plugins in it, such as Easy Mix 2 or Neural DSP Sam Sims, the CPU overloads. I'm using a laptop with 20 gigs of RAM and an Intel Core i7 but Pro Tools can't handle even two tracks with third-party plugins inserted on them. Laptop is defragmented and nothing running in the background, etc. If you could show in a video how you set up Pro Tools for a professional production, that would be beyond fantastic. Thanks for all your advice and take care. Ben. Well, Ben, I've been through the ringer when it comes to setting up computers for audio production. And I just gotta say this, um, Pro Tools, even though it's my main DAW of choice and I've been using it now for 15 years, is very, very finicky. Now I'm using Pro Tools on a Mac 
and I always have. I do use PCs, but whenever I'm using PCs, I usually stick with Reaper and it's only for live recording. But with that being said, I do have friends that run Pro Tools on PCs. And the one thing I've learned from talking to them is that you really have to optimize your machine and make sure that all of your plugins are up to date and that there's nothing happening in the background that might not be that obvious as far as something that might be causing extra CPU usage. Because if you have 20 gigs of RAM and an i7 processor and your computer is relatively new, like within the last seven years new, it should be able to handle these plugins with relative ease. Now, I know the Neural DSP plugins use a lot of uh, horsepower, DSP horsepower, and Easy Mix, I'm not too sure about. I use Easy Drummer, and I know Easy Drummer on my machine was never a problem, even when using my old 2006 MacBook Pro. So I don't think the Easy Mix stuff should be any different. But again, I would say you're gonna wanna make sure that all of your plugins are up to date and that they are compatible with your operating system. And if you're using a PC, I know you're more than likely using Windows 10. So just do a double check, make sure that your version of Pro Tools and all of your plugins are 100% compatible with the exact version of the operating system that you're using. Now I've had situations even with my Mac computers where there might be one plugin, even if I'm not using it, would continuously crash Pro Tools and eat up CPU. Again, even when I'm not using it, just because that plugin wasn't compatible when I did an OS upgrade. So Ben, I hope that answers your question. And again, just double check and make sure that every single aspect of your rig is 100% compatible. Because if it's eating up that much CPU, something doesn't sound right. So please update me and keep me posted on how that works out for you. Okay, our next question comes from Jesus. Hello there. I'm reaching out to you because I have a bit of a problem when mixing vocals. Just like many of your other subscribers, I produce my own music. So I record all instruments and vocals myself, but I don't quite like my vocal tracks Hardly ever. I don't know if it's because of the mic or if I just don't like my voice characteristics. I find it to be quite nasally and I don't know how to solve it with EQ. It's hard to be objective when it's my own voice. Do you have any tips for this problem? Thank you for all of your content and for helping me reach the point that I'm at because of your tutorials. Cheers from Spain. Okay, well, Jesus, this is an excellent question. And I'm willing to bet that the reason why you're not happy with your vocal mix is pretty much probably down to two simple things. Now, when people record their own vocals, the number one frequency that tends to build up are the lower mids. And when I say the lower mids, I mean anything between 250 hertz to 1K, that range. So I would start by trying to cut a little bit in that range. Now you don't wanna to cut too much. You wanna cut 10 dB or anything like that. Start with like, you know, a two dB cut, maybe four, five, seven dB cut. Uh, and see if that helps your vocal track sound less nasally. I'd resort to that first before any boosting or any other extreme cuts in other areas. And of course, roll off all frequencies, I don't know, below 100 hertz. You don't really need any of that super duper sub range on a vocal track. And also, if you haven't downloaded it yet, be sure to download my free quick EQ guide if you wanna see all of my starting points for when I start out a mix as far as EQ goes. I will leave a link to the free guide below in this video's description. And the other issue I'm willing to bet has has to do with simple level control. And I just wanna say this, when it comes to compressing your vocal, you're gonna to wanna to compress your vocal within multiple stages for a nice transparent, but even vocal sound that doesn't sound overly squashed. So what I mean by this is what I prefer to do is compress before my EQ, just a little, maybe by a few dB, then I EQ, and then I compress a second time, maybe a little more heavily by, you know, maybe 5 dB, 6 dB, 7 dB. And then I tend to use a brick wall limiter just to catch any peaks uh, to keep my vocal, again, nice and consistent, but without them sounding compressed. Now, this is nothing unique to me. Pretty much most heavy music producers utilize a similar approach, but give it a shot. And I'd be more than willing to bet that you're gonna end up liking your vocal sound a lot more than you have in the past. Again, a buildup of lower mids and uncontrollable vocal sound as far as dynamic range is concerned can really give the effect of an amateurish, not so palatable vocal sound. And these two tweaks should help set you in the right direction. So Jesus, thank you for your question. Okay, our next question comes from Mr. Josh. Hi, Bobby. I have a couple of questions. What is your strategy for applying delay for thickening a stereo source? Do you do it? What instruments do you use it on? And in what manner? Also, what are some viable business directions for a studio these days? Seems that video and program subscriptions are a big piece. Do you get a lot of ground up recording projects? Now, Josh also mentions here that he has his own brewing company in Southington, Connecticut called Witch Doctor Brewing. So if you're ever in the area, check it out. And he also asks if it's worth recording his own band or if he should outsource the project. Okay, well, Josh, you asked some very interesting and some uh, very good questions here. Now, the first part of your question about thickening up uh, mono sources, yes, I do do it from time to time. 
For example, let's say I'm doing a live mix of like a trio where I'm mixing a band that was recorded live and there's only one guitar, uh, bass and drums. I'm generally gonna wanna widen that single guitar uh, recording so it gives the effect almost like two guitars. And the way I do it is very simple. I take the mono track, duplicate it, and I delay the one side by maybe 15 to 25 milliseconds just to create a natural hole in the middle of the stereo field. It works wonders, again, when you're working with only a single guitar performance, but you want that nice wide sound. Now, another way I do it is with a vocal performance where I want, let's say, a chorus to be bigger. I'll have the vocalist track a double, the original performance will be right up the middle, and then within the mix, I'll take the double and I'll use a delay plugin, which is a mono to stereo delay plugin, and I utilize the exact same approach by you know splitting the sides off and delaying the one side by you know 15 to 20 to 25 milliseconds to create a hole in the middle and to create a perceivably wider vocal sound uh, for bigger sections of the song. And those are the two main ways that I tend to use this type of effect. Now to answer your question about if I do a lot of ground up recordings, hell yeah, I get tons and tons of uh, projects coming through the studio where I do everything from pre-production all the way through to the final master. Now, because of everything that's been happening within the world over the course of this past year, I've been mainly sticking with mixing just because, you know, it's not too safe to have a bunch of people crammed into a small area. But before the apocalypse and after the apocalypse, I'll be back to tracking full productions out of my studio. I'm still doing it right now, but again, I'm trying to leave space in between just to keep things safe for everyone involved. You also asked if this is a viable uh, business model, and to be honest with you, yes, because owning a studio these days is incredibly cheap. All it comes down to is having some solid business skills and some solid audio skills, as well as just being a cool hang in the studio. The days of big studios are unfortunately on their way out because it's very difficult for these studios to pay their bills with such high overhead, especially when you can achieve amazing results in your basement. Now, that doesn't mean bands are not looking for producers. I get hired all the time, and there are producers out there that are busier than ever, but the truth is the smart ones have downsized and they run a nice, lean, and efficient business with very low overhead. So in other words, what I'm saying is you can run a profitable studio. You just have to be smart and intentional with the gear you buy, and you have to be business-minded, and you just have to be a cool person to hang around. Now, it seems like you already have some business skills in your back pocket since you have your own brewing company, so that'll definitely help you out if you decide to get into audio as a profession. Now, you also asked if you should outsource your band, and I'm gonna be honest, if you don't have any experience and you don't, you know, you don't know a lot about editing right now, you don't have a lot of experience mixing, that might be an avenue that you might wanna pursue, but that really comes down to your experience and if you feel comfortable, uh, again, mixing, mastering, and editing an entire production on your own right now. If it's a low stress situation and it's not like, you know, this is gonna be a major label release and you guys are doing it for fun, then I would say, yeah, it'd be a great learning experience for you. But if it's something that you wanna sound 100% professional, then maybe you should outsource, like I said, the editing and mixing and mastering. And just stick to the basic tracking, you know, like recording DIs and those elements of the recording process. And vocals, vocals are pretty easy to record. So Josh, thank you for your question. Good luck with your studio if you decide to open one up and uh, good luck with your brewery. And I'd love to check it out uh, again once the apocalypse is over with. Okay, and our final question here comes from Sergio. Hey Bobby, love the channel. Your work is really inspiring and I can't stress enough how useful the tips you put out there have been for my productions. For the Q&A, what's your favorite raw or unconventional heavy mix or album slash EP? Stuff that isn't clean and clear by industry standards. Sergio. Well, Sergio, thank you for your question. And uh, I just want to say this. I've been finding myself, especially within the last like five years or so, really getting into some 90s productions that I wasn't too crazy about when they first came out back in the day. Now, I'm a metal guy. I grew up on Pantera, Metallica, Megadeth, Carcass, At The Gates. So my heart is really in those polished, you know, super metallic sounding productions. And I remember being a kid and just hating the sound of like a lot of the alternative bands. I shouldn't say hating the sound, but I always tended to gravitate 
towards the more clean, metallic sounding, again, productions. But with that being said, in recent years, I've really found myself appreciating the sound of Ross Robinson's early productions, like on the early Korn albums, and even some of his later work, I think is really cool and has such a distinct sound to it. Again, I appreciate it so much more now than I did back then. Maybe that's because so many productions sound so sterile these days that when I hear bands, you know, sound like actual bands, I just appreciate it more. I've also in recent years become obsessed with Steve Albini, who's someone that I really didn't pay much attention to back when I was younger. Not like many other people from my generation, of course, I'm a Nirvana fan, but I was always more of a fan of Nevermind than In Utero. But in recent years, I've really kind of grown to appreciate the sound of In Utero. So much so that I don't know which one I like more. I do like Nevermind and I like In Utero, but for two different reasons. The thing that's cool about Nevermind is that it sounds very pop, very polished, and kind of like, you know, kind of leans more towards a little towards the metal side. But In Utero, again, recently, I just love and really appreciate the natural ambience around that album, uh, how he let the band just perform. He knocked out the entire album in two weeks, which is amazing for a major label record. It's not polished by any means, but still sounds epic huge and again like a band is sitting playing right in front of you in a room and as far as ross robinson goes obviously the first corn record first slipknot first two slipknot records listening back now i think they sound great and they capture the energy of the band it wasn't so much about the clarity and precision as it was about the energy and just the personality of the band shining through and i understand that more now than ever so hopefully that answers your question those are some more raw unpolished sounded productions that i'm a fan of these days that kind of you know fall outside of the ring of polished metal production but um I'm digging them. Now, I'd just like to shout out and thank everyone on my email list who's taken the time to write in these questions. And again, if I haven't gotten to your question yet, be patient. I will eventually get to it in one of these upcoming videos. If you found this video helpful, like, comment, subscribe, and share. And do not forget to click the little bell icon so you can be notified every time I upload one of the weekly videos on all things metal and rock production. You can both like and follow me on Facebook and Instagram. Links are in the description below. And again, you can download my quick EQ guide for absolutely free. There's a link below in this video's description. Download it to check out all of my EQ settings that I generally start with when starting a mix. Again, the PDF is below in this video's description box. Until next time, happy recording.